out who said that extraordinarily um, over-the-top remark. Um, <laughs> must have been someone I paid. Uh, uh, was Larry or Ken? Uh, I don't know. Anyway, um, somebody with no real judgment. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, anyway, it's a great pleasure to talk about my latest book, which might be seen as a follow-on from the last one, which was written just before the crisis, and then we had the crisis, which was worse than I thought, so I had to rethink it all. And this is the result of my rethinking. Uh, and uh, uh, the book is an attempt to set in uh, uh, out uh, an overview of what we should think about this extraordinarily important event uh, in uh, economic history, uh, in financial history, and in, I think, international relations as well, uh, because it's uh, changed the world. And what I think is special about the book, uh, different from all the uh, immense number of titles on the crisis, is that it sees this as a part of a global crisis. Uh, it links it to the Asian financial crisis, which many of you, I think, will remember, and, uh, and as part of a, a global financial system. The vast majority of books uh, basically treat this as if it were, for very obvious reasons, essentially an American event, only of interest to Americans, because it's written by, those books have been written by Americans, and they're not really aware there's anywhere else in the world. So um, a characteristic I'm sure you recognize is familiar of all immensely large and powerful countries. Uh, so uh, I have a different perspective. One of the advantages of being in a, a relatively small country with declining powers that was, has a more global perspective on these matters, uh, I think. And working for the FT has, of course, been an immense privilege in this regard in terms of the people I speak to and the contacts I have. So my book, in addition to looking at the American crisis, looks in enormous depth at the Eurozone crisis and sets in this global context. So what I'm going to discuss, this is a big book, I apologize for that. It's not as big as it looks. Um, there are about 350 pages of text and tables. The other 150 pages are footnotes and references and index. And really, you don't have to read all that. Uh, the, uh, uh, but it is more an academic book, I have to admit, than a, than a journalist book. It's not full of juicy stories. Uh, it's full of charts. Uh, so it's perhaps appropriate that I'm in this sort of environment. I'm going to divide my remarks into two parts. I'll get through it as quickly as I can. Um, the first part is my view of what happened, what we call the shifts, what I call the shifts, the changes in the whole world economic system in the financial sector, and the shocks, which are obviously this, this wave of crises. I should say, obviously, we're not through it yet. There is a recovery now in the US, not an exceptional one. In fact, the weakest recovery the US has had pretty well ever. Uh, the Eurozone, pretty obviously, is not recovering. Uh, it's not in crisis anymore, but it's not recovering. And uh, we don't know whether it will relapse. Uh, and there are some interesting other developments in the world which I won't have enough time to discuss. But this, uh, this environment of, of crisis is still with us. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the solutions, the lessons that, we, that, the, that the policymakers have learned and the extent to which those lessons are going to work. I mean, that's really pretty important, isn't it? So my first point is this was a big failure. Uh, it was a failure of institutions, of regulatory institutions, of monetary policy institutions. And more importantly, uh, for me, as an economist and economic commentator, it was a failure of economic understanding. And uh, the, um, the, the big mistake, I think I may come to this again, is not that people fail to forecast it. To some degree, if you can forecast precisely when a crisis will happen, it's not going to happen. You know, that can be the very process fact that you know that something's going to happen is likely to lead, or almost everybody agrees something that's likely to happen. It tends to mean that it won't happen. I think the real failing was actually much deeper, which was to the vast majority of people uh, looking at this, and I think to a significant extent this is true of me, a crisis on the scale that happened was actually inconceivable. And that's different from its merely being unforecast. Uh, it was something they, we didn't understand. And before the crisis, we had what I refer to in the book as the old orthodoxy, 
as opposed to the new orthodoxy of today, and which is in essence in the developed world, in the dominant economies, and particularly in the US, that we had inflation targeting, and inflation was kept well under control. We had a deregulated uh, financial sector uh, g governed by self-interest. Um, we would have a stable uh, uh, economy. Um, and indeed, they, they, they praised exactly the consequences of this combination in referring to something called the Great Moderation. And I quote, at the beginning of one of my chapters, a speech by Ben Bernanke, obviously an immensely important and intelligent figure, uh, a speech he gave in 2004, in which he said, we've got this tremendous success of monetary policy, this remarkable stability, uh, which we call the great moderation, and to a significant extent, I believe we did it. Okay? That's what he thought four years before everything, three years before everything blew up. And the fact that this turned out to be wrong, that this perception of how we should run economies was wrong, is a gigantic shock to macroeconomics as a subject. Um, and it's the second such uh, shock, the first big shock, which I also lived through uh, just after I'd studied, was the great inflation of the 70s, which sort of blew up uh, naive Keynesianism and led to monetarism and, and all the rest of it since then. And we're now, I think, inevitably in the second process of adjusting and learning from experience. And I think there are, I'm going to uh, argue that uh, the, uh, um, the way of thinking about this is that there were macroeconomic shocks, perhaps I should call it macroeconomic shifts, and financial uh, shocks. Uh, these are uh, interconnected. Um, I'm going to simplify, and I'll add a couple of points. Um, uh, the macroeconomic trigger, I argue, for the whole process was a profound shift in the world economy that occurred after the Asian crisis, completely understandable change, which uh, was followed by a very big shift in emerging economy policy. Um, which uh, made actually, for the first time, the emerging world as a whole, um, if you aggregate it whole, a very, very large capital exporter. Uh, and, uh, and it shifted um, the global pattern of savings relative to investment. There was also an investment cut in a, quite a number of countries around here, a huge increase in savings, particularly in China, also later in the oil exporting countries, and a big decline in global real interest rates, which is a very remarkable phenomenon. And this then uh, was associated with the rise, of, uh, with the, along with a few other changes, of very large global imbalances, which led to an endogenous uh, monetary response in the developed world, which basically accommodated these imbalances with a huge credit expansion. And there were also, and I have this discussed in my book, but I don't have time now, some important changes in income distributions within our economies. Uh, and in the propensity to invest in our economies, which further exacerbated this global savings glut condition uh, and further in increased the extent to which um, monetary policy became extremely expansionary in the early 2000s, not only in America, but also in Europe, encouraging European bubbles. And meanwhile, there was a financial trigger which was in that context, I've already said, credit creation was the vehicle for handling this new world of saving gluts. Um, this credit creation created endogenous fragility, uh, fragility in the financial system, financial innovation as uh, the economy liberalized, as the financial system liberalized, and uh, this triggered what Heim, the Hyman Minsky cycle, um, the, the process of mania leading to mania, um, with Minsky's great idea, which I think is central to th this way of thinking about what happens to a financial sector in these conditions, which is that stability destabilizes. A world which seems stable, where there's a trigger which starts off a process of boom, a bubble, and then boom, is one in which the process of the financial sector itself destabilizes unless it's stopped, and there was no reason for the regulators to stop it because they wanted this booming growth to make their economies function. The Eurozone is embedded within this crisis, 
But it's also the global crisis in miniature, in miniature, if you look at it. I'll come to this in a moment. I've described this as a, as a bad monetary marriage. There are highly divergent preferences in economic structures within the Eurozone, radically incomplete institutions. Uh, in the honeymoon period of the first few years of the Eurozone, Basically, everybody got what they wanted. The Germany had a rapidly growing surplus. Uh, the countries in the south, particularly Spain, had a huge domestic credit boom and a housing boom, which triggered an enormous rise in real income. So everybody was very happy. But then the crisis hit. All the capital reversed or stopped and then reversed members found themselves unhappily married. One side complained about the other's profligacy, and the, the other side complained about the former's meanness. And that's basically where we've been ever since in these creditor-debtor relationships. It's important just to, uh, they cannot make it work well, and they can't break it up. Breaking it up is too, um, too, uh, too difficult. It, it, there's quite an interesting and important point, by the way, which is an asymmetry, an absolutely core asymmetry in the world, which is that within the Eurozone, because of the nature of the institutions of the Eurozone, the creditor countries determine the nature of the outcome, the resolution of the financial crisis. So in the Eurozone, it's the creditor countries. In the world, as a whole, the dominant debtor determines the resolution. And the dominant debtor determines the resolution, uh, and everybody else complains about the way it determines the resolution, because it owns the printing press. And the question is, in these crises, it's very, very important. In a crisis, there's only one safe asset left, which is money, the money that everybody's willing to hold, OK? In the, in the Eurozone, the institution that creates the money that everybody was willing to hold, which solved the crisis to the extent it could, the ECB is more or less effectively controlled, more or less effectively controlled by Germany. In the world, the relevant printing press is controlled by the US. And that changes and shapes the response. And of course, it's why everybody else in the world absolutely hates this outcome, but tough, that's how it is. Um, now, let me just go briefly through how this, some of these story, uh, which I think is really rather a remarkable story. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about these, the trigger, the, the real house price bubbles and global real interest rates. This I hadn't expected until I looked for it, and it would surprise me. Uh, one needs a measure of global real interest rates, uh, real interest rates on safe securities. The simplest one is to take it from a, 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 an open economy with AAA rated assets, as they then were, uh, which, which sells index linked bonds. Index linked bonds are perfect measures of real interest rates. Uh, and the UK has been doing this for now for a really long time. You've got the data back to the mid 80s. And if you track it against the US and other countries that have issued such bonds more recently, there's almost a perfect sim relationship, which is exactly what you would expect, because the the bonds of highly rated liquid, uh, uh, liquid assets of, of countries which are open to the capital account should basically yield the same amount. And this is quite interesting, because you basically see three stages in this story for the UK. First, before the Asian crisis, before 1907, the real interest rate was about 4%, which is what you would expect in a booming world. Then there was the Asian crisis, and absolutely coincidentally, the real interest rate halved from nearly 4% to 2%. That's a massive shift in real interest rates, and it occurred in a year and a half. And it's perfectly coincident with the Asian crisis, and I can't think of any other reason for it. Um, and this, as you can see, then continued to the late uh, 2007 at about 2%. Then there was the global crash. Uh, there was a, really a savings glut. We moved from a semi-global savings glut to a massive global savings glut in the crisis. That's the definition of a depression slump situation. And real interest rates went to, down to zero, which is where we are now. We have been in a zero real interest rate world on safe assets for six years. That's an absolutely astonishing fact. It's an absolutely astonishing fact. Uh, and this is non-monetary. I don't see any monetary explanation for this shift uh, uh, on this scale over this time. There are real processes at work. And the second point to take from this chart is I put the real house prices for UK, Spain, and the US. These are the three most important house price bubbles in the West associated with the crisis. The UK is at the top, 
green, then the Spain and US are immediately coincident, and you see the US started turning in 2006. Spain and U US crashed, and the reason they crashed is that unlike the UK, they responded to this massive rise in the price of real assets, which is, I think, clearly triggered by this global fall in real interest rates, by building immensely more houses, and that ultimately crashed the market. It wasn't a sustainable bubble. In the UK, we didn't, so the bubble didn't crash as completely. That's, uh, it was a relatively modest change. These are what, this is what happened to the, I've said, the global capital flows, the net capital flows across regions, starting just before the financial crisis in Asia in 96, and you can see how massively they expanded relative to world GDP between 96 and 2006. Um, uh, uh, and that, that what emerged was basically three huge surplus regions, uh, uh, East Asia, China and, uh, China and Emerging Asia, which is yellow, uh, the, um, the green block, which is old industrial countries, mainly Germany and Japan, and the oil exporters. And there were two regions that emerged as the capital importers that they took the capital from net. Um, they were the US, which absorbed 70% of it, and peripheral Europe. And every single country in that second group went into crisis. And I argue in the book at length, this is not an accident. This is exactly how this worked. Um, the, the capital was absorbed through a crisis-creating process. It wasn't efficiently invested. It was invested or uh, uh, wasted largely in consumption and housing bubbles, housing construction, useless houses, it turned out, in these economies driven by credit boom. An important element of this new world order that emerged after the Asian crisis was the massive accumulation of foreign currency reserves, official capital and capital outflows, these are essentially, by predominantly emerging economies as a way of shielding themselves against crisis to build up foreign currency reserves, go back to export-led growth, keep the exchange rates down. And this explosion is quite staggering from much less than $2 trillion back in 97 to $12 trillion today. I haven't even put in the sovereign wealth funds. And of about um, 45, 40, 45% of that accumulation is China alone. That's the blue block at the bottom as China accumulated reserves going from $100 billion to $4 trillion today. But it's not the only country. This is a net capital export and predominantly inevitably into US liabilities because if you're trying to buy reserves, you basically buy either you, you end up two-thirds of global reserves are in dollars, so of course they end up tending to buy the liabilities of, you, of the US government. Meanwhile, domestically, as I said, with these excessive funds coming into uh, the US, I'm focusing particularly on the US, the, um, the, uh, the, this was itself contractionary. It led to an, an appreciation, a strengthening of the real exchange rate, a uh, rapid growth of the external deficit. This is contractionary in terms of demand. The, the central bank responded with a very aggressive monetary policy, which you can see turning towards the end of the 90s. Um, you can see a clear uptick, and they were very comfortable with the massive liberalization of the financial sector, which is shown in this enormous growth of financial sector debt, which is the green uh, area, which really explodes upwards. Um, and the other big accumulation, which you can say again see a clear uptick in the late 90s, is of household debt. Corporate debt didn't rise so much. But you can see that over the period as a whole, there's really a massive expansion in leverage in the American economy, which blew up in the crisis and has since declined appreciably, not so dramatically, but appreciably by the end of last year. Though, so this is annual data, and you can see there's been a real contraction, but it's not gone. And one final thing happened, which I think is also important as part of this very complex process that I tried to describe, the way I think of it, is a massive leverage within the core financial sector. And here, this happens to be data, uh, I don't have comparable data for the US, from the UK. The UK also has gigantic banks, internationally open banks. Um, one of the things that many people might not realize, it sounds very weird, but the aggregate balance sheet of the UK banking sector was as big as the aggregate balance sheet of the US banking sector before the crisis because of these huge global banks. And the and the 
the really interesting thing here, um, that's why this chart is so startling, is if you just look at the, um, the line coming up from the, the bottom, that's the, 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 the measure of the, the aggregate leverage, the ratio of, of the total balance sheet to equity of these banks. And you can see it started off in 2000 about 16 times, and by 2008 it had gone to nearly 35 times. So the leverage basically doubled over this relatively short period, all in about four years. And it happened, and this is the fascinating thing, um, at the time when the risk weighted, the riskiness of the assets, the risk weighted, risk weights are just the value of the assets um, to uh, tell you how much capital you need, was collapsing. So basically what the, the, the banks were saying to themselves and to the accountants and to the regulators is we don't need any capital because our assets are so safe. And they're getting so safe so quickly in those just four years we can double leverage. And so that's why all the banking sector of the Western world, the whole banking sector, was telling the regulators in the summer of 2007 when the crisis started that the banking system had never been as well capitalized. And it's not because it was really well capitalized, it's because they'd basically written down the riskiness of their assets to such an extent that they didn't seem to need any capital. And that was the endogenous process uh, which the break moderation caused, because they were quite right. They hadn't had any losses recently. Stability destabilizes. Um, then, of course, the crisis hit, and we moved into the present period, or the post-crisis period. The crisis hit, there was a, a massive panic in the financial sector, possibly the biggest panic ever in the late uh, autumn of 2008 and early 2009. This led to this massive series of interventions to save weak financial institutions all across the West, not just in the US, in Britain and Netherlands, uh, Germany, um, uh, and so forth. And it led very, very swiftly to a massive loosening of monetary policy, which is the experience we've had here. And here, the ch this chart is fascinating. So I put the the short-term central bank intervention rates going back to 1994, the four biggest developed country central banks, um, the Fed, the Bank of England, the Bu Bundesbank ECB, and the Bank of Japan. And you can see we've all ended up at near zero. Uh, the highest rate of any of them is half a percent. We've been near zero. The ECB resisted very, very hard to get there. You can see the green twitch upwards, which is one of the most insane episodes, I think, in monetary policy, where they decided to tighten monetary policy because they really wanted to. They really wanted to. And when they finally realized what was happening to their economy, the deflation process now at work, they collapsed too. They've now gone down to essentially to zero. And the reason I put this long period in is you can see there a country that has had near, near zero rates for 20 years. And that country is Japan. Okay? They've had near zero rates for 20 years, and we've all joined it. Okay? So the world has become Japan uh, in the developed world. But remember, the developed world, even today, is diminishing importance, but at market prices, it's more than about 60% of the world economy still. Um, roughly, between 50 and 60 percent. So this is an astonishing phenomenon, and the really remarkable thing about it is that it didn't begin to be enough. Uh, in spite of offering banking, the banking sector basically free money, the banks wouldn't lend. Uh, they were too shocked. They didn't think there was any good credit risk. So the central bank decided to balance, expand their balance sheets. So this is what's happened to the balance sheets of the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, Bank of Japan, and ECB. You can see in the Bank of England and the Fed have both expanded their balance sheets to 25% of GDP, which is uh, basically unprecedented. Uh, very remarkable how similar. The ECB did expand its balance sheet from about 10% to 32% and then allowed it to run off. Uh, and they've now decided very publicly, very explicitly, this was a terrible mistake and they're now going to reverse it. So the ECB is now in the expansions phase. The Bank of England and the Fed have stopped expanding, but they're not contracting yet. And the Bank of Japan is in completely other space. It's now, I haven't got the very latest announcement, but the Bank of Japan's announcements imply that the, the, the ratio of central bank assets to GDP will be above 80% of GDP fairly soon and continue on upwards. So we are in an episode of quite extraordinary monetary policy, absolutely unprecedented, 
completely unprecedented in response to the total collapse of the financial sector. And is this leading to the hyperinflation everybody feared? No, it isn't. It's leading actually to continued deflation. So I think it's important to understand what an extraordinary world this is. This is uh, balance sheet deflation really at work. If you look at those policies, they have been relatively successful in the US and so far completely unsuccessful in the Eurozone. Or not completely, that's unfair. They've stopped the crisis. But in terms of recovery, the stories are utterly different. So this basically shows you the contrast between the US post-recovery, post-crisis and the Eurozone. The main reason I think the US has done better is they cleaned up their financial sector much more quickly, much more aggressively than the Europeans did. They, uh, um, they as usual, they allowed a lot of default. They allowed the, the, lots of people were pushed into bankruptcy. It's been a terribly brutal process, but they actually did have a debt reduction that hasn't happened in Europe. And of course, they could coordinate, for at least briefly, fiscal monetary policy to start the boost. So the US, both GDP and domestic demand, has expanded not quickly. It's about 2% a year. It's a very weak recovery by US standards, but it's at least a recovery. If you look at the Eurozone, the green line is GDP and the red line is real demand. You can see that real demand is in the second quarter of this year was 2% below, sorry, 5% below the pre-crisis level. That was uh, uh, more than six years later, it was still 5% below. This is basically a slump. Incredibly weak recovery and GDP essentially the same. The, the fact that the GDP line has done better than the, than the demand line is basically because the Eurozone has improved its current account balance dramatically, of course, at the expense of the demand in the rest of the world. But the Eurozone story there is very, very depressing. Now, if we try to put this crisis in the long run concept, context and try to ask ourselves, well, what does this mean in terms of the growth of these two major economies? Uh, well, this is the answer. Um, it's a very simple answer. I have the chart in my book. Uh, I've got US GDP going back to 1950, and that's the red line. And I fitted a very simple exponential regression line, um, trend line, um, um, uh, to this from 1950 to 2007. That's the blue line. And then I extrapolate forward what would have happened if the US had continued on that standard line all the way up to today. And the green line shows, the, and it's on the right-hand side, the deviations from that trend of actual GDP to that trend. And you can see there were some oscillations up to now, uh, positive oscillations, particularly in the 60s. We know the 60s were a great boom uh, period. Um, but fairly close to zero. And today, or this was actually goes up to the second quarter of this year, um, GDP is 18% smaller than trend. That's an enormous slump. So the losses in the US are absolutely gigantic. And now let me turn to the Eurozone story. As I said, I've only shown you the global imbalances. These are the Eurozone imbalances. Um, it's a not dissimilar picture. It's very interesting how similar it is. As I said, it's the world in miniature. The red line shows the overall balance of the Eurozone. It's been roughly imbalanced till recently when it moved into this very big surplus, as I've shown you. And in the early years of the crisis, before the crisis, there was a huge credit boom in the south, particularly in Spain. Spain dominates that blue uh, rectangle, which is the capital importers. The capital exporters are dominated by Germany and the Netherlands. The other creditors are mostly the Netherlands. Um, the, the, these deficits exploded in response to um, uh, this basically destabilizing booms in the south and extreme credit retrenchment in the north, fiscal and credit and very tight credit policies controlling uh, and the unwillingness to borrow. And we got these huge imbalances. Again, it blew up in 2008. The credit dried up and the countries in the south all went into deficit, uh, sorry, all went into depression, slump. It was a massive cutbacks in uh, imports. The whole Eurozone went into surplus. Almost every country went into surplus. And we ended up with this period, this period of absolute demand collapse, which I have shown you already. That was the, um, this is essentially a sudden stop. Anyone who's been familiar with emerging country and developing country crises will be familiar of this. But 
the immediate re response of this crisis was a massive spike in spreads in between German rates and rates in these other vulnerable countries after a long period when ludicrously the spreads had all collapsed because the markets had completely misestimated, underestimated risk before the crisis. There was a spike up uh, in, I've just shown you Portugal, I haven't put Greece in, it gets just too big. Uh, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Ireland, and you can see a series of policy interventions by the ECB which I've indicated. The most important is the OMT, the outright monetary transactions of the summer of 2012. That really broke the panic. It was when the ECB said we will be a lender of last resort to governments, and this has brought spreads now to very low levels. So the crisis phase is gone, and you just have this chronic economic malaise. That's the great success of central banks. Again, it's the central bank involvement. However, the ECB, they, the Eurozone now has this very, very big problem, despite this massively expansionary monetary policy they now have, that inflation is far too low. So I put in the core inflation of a whole slew of important countries, the Germany and the countries trying to uh, restore competitiveness. And the crucial thing you can see is some countries have negative inflation, they're in deflation. Greece, for example, is in deflation. Spain is now in deflation. Portugal is in deflation, very mild. Uh, all the other countries are clustering close to 1%, including Germany. And that means all the countries that are trying to gain competitiveness against Germany are basically being forced into deflation. And because they're being forced into deflation and their growth is very low, the real burden of their debt is rising. And that almost certainly means, in my view, that there will be another debt crisis to come. So the, the process isn't over. Now, I thought I'd put in one... Uh, uh, one additional chart, and this is China, because I think it's a fascinating part of the story of this successive wave of crises. I've already indicated that, that in some profound way, the response to the Asian crisis triggered processes that led to, to a crisis ultimately in the West, and then the response of China to the Western crisis triggered processes that is creating very large problems for the Chinese government. It's a fascinating spiral of crises. Uh, the, so if you look at China's economy, and this is the structure of spending in the Chinese economy going back to 2000. So the, the yellow bars is household consumption as a share of GDP. The green is government consumption. The light blue-green is investment, and the bit at the top is net exports. And you can see that from 2000 to 2007, there was a huge expansion of investment relative to GDP, a giant expansion in net exports relative to GDP, and consumption, particularly private consumption, contracted really remarkably dramatically. Um, th th I've never seen a pattern like this in any economy. This is Chinese data, so they presumably know what they're talking about. The, then the crisis hit. The crisis destroyed net exports. Um, there was a very quick adjustment of net exports because external demand went. The Chinese government wanted to sustain demand, so they took the investment rate of 42% of GDP and they turned it into 48% of GDP, which is the highest rate of investment of any country, as far as I can see, ever. Uh, certainly any large country, maybe one or two small ones. And the, so they took the disequilibrium in their economy already massive and made it even bigger. And much of that, as you know, was associated with a huge credit boom. Credit almost doubled in China in four or five years and much of it went to real estate and to, and to real estate construction um, and a lot of that is going to turn out to be bad or quite a bit of that's going to turn out to be bad but even if they can manage the financial crisis elements which I think they will this is not a stable pattern so they basically have to reverse the structure of their economy back to where it was in 2000 they have to get back to that sort of structure. The investment rate shouldn't be 48%. In an economy now growing 7% a year, it should probably be 35% of GDP. And that means there's another stage of real restructuring, radical restructuring of an, of an incredibly important economy ahead of us in, as this cycle goes. So then that leads me to the second part, um, which are perhaps five, ten minutes. Um, what are the solutions to all this terrible mess, this, this endless spiral, this cycle of 
bubbles and bust which we seem to have got locked into uh, over the last uh, 20 years, this interaction between gl huge global macro forces and our very defective financial system, again, which you all experienced in the Asian crisis. I mean, essentially, the Western crisis is the Asian crisis on a much bigger scale um, and more internal. Okay. Um, well, we've got a new orthodoxy nowadays. Uh, this is what the Western um, policymakers think is the right way to manage their economy. So it's an updated version of the old orthodoxy. There's no fundamental change in macroeconomic thinking. Uh, the same reliance on monetary policy is the dominance tool. The same belief that fiscal policy should be basically balanced in all circumstances. And we have much the same financial system. We have inflation targeting just as before with the same inflation target. We haven't raised it or lowered it. I think there was a strong case for layering, raising it given the difficulties we've had at the zero bound. There's been no large scale debt restructuring. So if you look at our economies, even at the US, if you remember the figure I had earlier, yes, debt has fallen, but it's only back to 2003, 2002, three levels. That doesn't give you much of a cushion to expand through credit again. There's no adequate coordination with fiscal policy. We haven't used fiscal and monetary policy together well, except in the immediate aftermath of the quiet crisis. We have re-regulated the financial system, and we do rely on macroprudential policy, some idea of systemic oversight of the whole financial system. And the question is, is this going to be enough? And I suggest that there are two huge challenges. First, how do we get global demand without credit bubbles? With, that's the crucial thing. How do we get demand without credit bubbles? And how do we get a more stable financial system? So, as I said, we have the same financial system, tighter regulation. We hope for speedy resolution in cases of difficulty to avoid bailouts. But the regulation structure, and I'm going to come to this moment you have, is unbelievably complex and tortuous. Our banking sector is more concentrated before. I don't know how many people realize, but the major, the world's major banking sectors are now more concentrated than before, with more too big to fail banks. We ha the banks are still incredibly highly leveraged. And yes, they're not 35 to 1 now, but they're still 20 to 25 to 1. So that's an incredibly small cushion against losses. We still rely overwhelmingly on what has proved to be a hopelessly unreliable risk weighting of assets. That's still the core of the Basel process. And of course, it's still global, which means that an enormous amount of what the banks do really can't be overseen by any set of regulators. Nobody can regulate JP Morgan. I'm just giving you an example, because its balance sheet is everywhere. The, even the US authority they, requires the cooperation, the most intimated cooperation of every regulator in the world. Doesn't, that's not the way the world works. It's, in, it's, a, it's an illusion that this institution can be regulated. And in fact, since Jamie Dimon, who really is a very clever person, wasn't able to pick up what was going on in his own bank in this famous London Wales story, makes it pretty clear that no regulator could have. So I think you have to say that this is very, I'm very skeptical about this. Now, um, this is a lovely little quote which I've taken from a wonderful paper by Andy Haldane and Vasilios Maduros, which, was, which is the Jackson Hole Conference of 2012. You can look it up. I, it's called The Dog and the Frisbee, and it's the most amusing uh, um, paper about bank regulation ever written. So you'll all love it. It's just wonderful. And its basic argument is that everything we're doing is crazy. And I would like to point out that Andy Haldane was the head of bank regulation in the U UK, so he knew what, of what he was speaking. So so what he said is, as of July this year, that was 2012, two years after the enactment of Dodd-Frank, a third of the required rules under Dodd-Frank had been finalized. Those completed have added a further 8,843 pages to the rule book. At this rate, once completed, Dodd-Frank could comprise 30,000 pages of rulemaking, and that's roughly 1,000 times larger than Glass-Steagall. Dodd-Frank makes Glass-Steagall look like throat clearing. By the way, the Europeans are going to get to 60,000 pages. I cannot believe that this structure regulation is workable. Uh, it's going to miss things and it's going to drive people completely, utterly crazy. And they're going to spend almost all their life trying to live within the, the letter of the regulations without obeying the spirit. Um, so the regulatory system we adopted is essentially a reflection of the fact we've got essentially the same system as before, but we don't trust it. 
That's really the worst possible world. We've got this exactly the same system, with a, but we don't trust it. And that's the way the West is managing the financial system, which is, of course, remains today at least the most important financial system in the world. Um, we also hope that the, we will manage this system well with what's called macroprudential policy, which is ideally a way of protecting the financial sector from the cycle and the cycle from the financial sector. So managing the interface between the two to avoid the sort of process we saw before. But that too will raise some very difficult challenges. It's very difficult to judge macro interventions in the financial system. A lot of the judgments are going to be enormously politically unpopular. They basically involve telling <laughs> whole classes of people whether they can borrow not or not. There's going to be some very big technical problems because in many cases the macro prudential policy is going to conflict with the direction of monetary policy. I discuss that in more detail in the book. And there are inevitably going to be unintended consequences as the system tries to arbitrage around the macro prudential regulation through the shadow banking system which is going to grow very rapidly. So uh, uh, my view is that instead of this immense complexity we would have done much better simply to insist on much higher capital capital and less regulation. The, the banks need to have a big enough cough cushion to survive pretty well any event and I give, uh, discuss the literature on that and come to the conclusion that the right, the least bad capital ratio is probably about 10 to 1 and if we had a banking sector that capitalized we could get rid of a lot of this extraordinary junk. Um, the, the next, the other big thing we have to do, and this is sort of my last main point, is deal with the underlying demand problem in our world economic system as I've defined it. The inability to generate adequate demand in the world economy over the last two decades without um, destabilizing and ultimately destructive credit bubbles. Um, uh, we've had, uh, uh, but we certainly not managed this problem yet in the developed countries. We are still um, desperately tr trying to regain growth, both on the supply side and the demand side. And obviously a very big question is why has the crisis been so costly? And I think part of it is that the pre-crisis trends were themselves unsustainable. They were masked by the credit boom. The crisis damaged economies, particularly confidence. These damage seems to be very long lasting. The crisis bequeathed a huge debt overhang, which we've only just started to deal with, and policymakers adopted some very bad post-crisis policies, especially in the Eurozone, with a one-sided focus on austerity. So we've made a pretty fair mess of it, and that's why our recoveries are so weak. The solutions. In the short run, right now, I think the best the least bad solution is higher public investment. The public sector is able to borrow in many countries very at exceptionally low rates, um, and we could even use better cooperation between monetary policy and fiscal policy, including Milton Friedman's suggestion in a slump of helicopter money. Adair Turner has a very nice uh, column today. Uh, in the FT recommending such a policy. We need much faster debt restructuring, especially in the Eurozone, actually going out there restructuring debts. And that will be these, this combination of faster debt restructuring and more public investment will be the best response to what Larry Summers calls secular stagnation. In the Eurozone, this is particularly severe problem. Turning the Eurozone as a whole into greater Germany is failing. And the reason ultimately is Germany is an export-oriented economy. It depends on foreign demand. The Eurozone is three times as big as Germany, and it's not, it's too big to depend on foreign demand. It just doesn't, the world can't generate that demand. And of course, the other European countries don't have the competitiveness Germany has, and it's not, they're not going to develop it. They don't have that export sector. They need to turn it into an adjustment union. And a part of that adjustment union means they hit the inflation target. And if they're going to hit the inflation target, of four percent of two percent Germany's inflation has to be three to four percent and they're not getting anywhere near that they're they're not getting the traction they need in the long run I remain of the view 
that in an open global economy, it's the argument I made in both my previous books, the rational way for capital to go is from rich countries to poor countries. That's not going to happen with, uh, without a fundamental change in the insurance mechanisms for developing countries. And the, the least bad way, I'm not saying it's going to happen, it isn't, is a much bigger IMF with a radically different governance with the emerging countries having a much bigger say. Otherwise, the, the insurance mechanisms that develop the emerging countries themselves are creating is the second best. But I think a situation in which the emerging world goes on being a huge net capital supplier to the developed world, which then wastes it comprehensively and creates crises, is completely crazy. On the domestic side, we have to deleverage our economies, and that means we have to move away from tax sub subsidizing of debt. We need equity sharing contracts. Uh, rather than pure debt contracts, particularly in housing finance, and I actually discuss the idea of uh, the idea of 100% reserve banking as one possible way of going with uh, higher equity ratios in genuine banks to uh, to make the the system more sound. More sound. So I've covered a lot of ground in this talk, and uh, only a small part of the book, I have to say. But my conclusions are basically as follows. This is obviously a massive crisis, and it's not over. And it has a huge shadow and echo. It's created lots of destabilization of the Chinese economy, too. And I think people have underestimated how severe a problem that is for China. I think it's manageable, but it is a big problem. Um, this was caused by the interaction, and I haven't even talked about inequality, the, the role of the financial sector, uh, or all that, because that's also important, but I don't have the time, between macroeconomic forces and financial fragility. The new orthodoxy is an improvement on the old orthodoxy, but it's likely to fail for reasons I've already indicated, because it neither provides a route for demand which doesn't involve more credit, and nor does it create a really robust financial sector. We need to make the macroeconomy domestically and globally much more balanced, finance much less cred fragile, and so to escape what I call a concatenation, a chain of global credit bubbles. That's the challenge. That's what I set out to discuss. I don't say that I've solved it, but I think that's pretty clearly the issue. And as till we do, we're going to have more of this. I can't predict where the next will be, but we're going to have more of it. Thank you for listening.